Some of us need a miracle this week. Maybe you need it in your marriage or your job or your health or your finances. And so this morning we're going to talk about what do you do when you need a miracle. And the background of the story that we're going to look at is that there were three enemies who were joining together to attack the nation of Judah. And so they faced three to one odds. In verse 1 of uh, chapter 20 it says, After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Meonites. And by the way, these were ancient relatives of the Dynamites, the Candelites, and the Gesundites. Okay, not really. Um, they came to war, got yeah, waged war against Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was king in Judah, and he was in big trouble. He was a triple threat, three enemies coming against him, and he doesn't know what to do. Maybe some of you feel like that way this morning. You ever felt like things are kind of ganging up on you and, and like things are in conspiracy against you? Ever had one of those days where everything just seems to go wrong? You know, the dishwasher overflows, your kid gets sent home from school, and you, you lose your job all in one day. Notice at the beginning of verse 1, it says, when does this happen to Jehoshaphat? It says, after this. These enemies came against them. After, after the, what's the after this? After what? Well, if you read the prior chapter, you find out they had just had a spiritual revival in the nation. And then along comes these enemies. Isn't it funny how so often, as soon as God really starts working in somebody's life or, or in your home or your family or, or your church, what happens? The enemy starts to increase his attacks. We have an enemy who doesn't like to see good things happening in our lives. He doesn't like to see us drawing closer to God. And so let me ask you, what is your natural reaction when you have an enemy come against you or you have an impossible situation come into your life? Well, the natural reaction is fear, right? You know, we we see these things that, that we don't know what to do about and we're afraid. Jehoshaphat was no exception. It says in verse 3 that he was alarmed. He was shaking in his boots when these three enemies came against him. But fear is not wrong as a, as a first reaction. It's normal. But it's the, the key is, what do you do with that fear? When you're faced with an impossible situation, when you've got enemies coming against you, do you get discouraged and give up? Do you get a negative attitude and, and have a pity party? Do you feel intimidated or motivated? Well, the people of Israel were not intimidated by this situation, and they did certain things that brought about an amazing miracle, probably one of the the most amazing in the entire Bible. And we can learn from what they did. The first thing they did is in verses 3 and 4. So Jehoshaphat hears about this vast army coming against him, and it says, Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. So step number one is simply to schedule time for prayer. Now, that seems really obvious, I know. But how often do you not do this? Say you have a crisis coming along in your life or a huge need or a desperate situation. How often do you actually schedule a time and actually put it on your calendar and say, hey, this is a big deal. We need a miracle. And so, you know, next Tuesday for three hours, we're going to get together and we're going to pray about this. Maybe you've never done that. I know that I don't do that very often. And then, of course, we ask, well, I wonder why God doesn't do any miracles in my life. Jehoshaphat needed a miracle. The first thing he did, he proclaimed a time of prayer. He put it on the schedule. And then he did a a couple other things. If you're really serious about this, if you really need a miracle bad, then it may involve a couple additional things that we see Jehoshaphat do. First, it may involve a fast. It says Jehoshaphat proclaimed a fast for all Judah. It doesn't say how long the fast was. It might have been one day or several days. We don't know. But fasting simply means to voluntarily not eat food for a period of time so that you can connect better with God. And there's many benefits to fasting, but one of the benefits is that it clears your mind and heightens your spiritual sensitivity. It's a physical action. You don't eat, but it has a spiritual impact. And then the second thing that a time of prayer may involve, it's, if it's a serious uh, need, is gathering people. Jehoshaphat gathered people from all over the country to come together and pray. When you need a miracle in your family, 
Maybe the place to start is you gather your family together and pray. Now, some of you might say, well, I don't want to burden my kids with our financial problems. I don't want them to know about our health problems or my job problems. I can't include them when we're we're praying about those serious kind of things. They wouldn't understand. Look at verse 13. It says, all the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. They were all involved. They didn't leave anybody out. And the truth is, for those of you who have kids, it's exciting to see kids pray about serious issues. And then when the answer comes, you can celebrate right along with them. And they'll be able to look back years later and they'll say, you know, remember when we helped to pray for that? And and remember when we saw a miracle? Verses 6 to 12 contain Jehoshaphat's prayer. It says he stood up before all the people. He prayed this prayer, one of the greatest prayers of faith in the Bible. In fact, I think if we all learned to pray a little more like Jehoshaphat, we would see more miracles. And in his prayer, Jehoshaphat asks God three questions, and then he makes a statement. And it's easy to pick these out because they all have the word not in them. In verse 6, he says, are you not? In verse 7, he says, did you not? In verse 12, he asks God, will you not? And then he says, we do not. This is what I call the Jehoshaphat prayer model. It's three questions and a statement. Very simple. Are you not, did you not, will you not, and we do not. Very simple, but it's a prayer of great faith. And it led to an unbelievable miracle. First he said, are you not. The first thing in a prayer of faith is you remind yourself who God is. In verse 6 he says, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not? The God who is in heaven. You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. The starting point in the prayer of faith is you remind yourself who God is. God has all power and all might. Is anything too hard for God? No. And so Jehoshaphat is is saying, are you not the God who can do anything? You can meet any need. There's no person, no situation, no disease, no problem that can withstand you. You rule over every circumstance, every situation that we will ever face. Next, Jehoshaphat says, did you not? So the next part is you remind yourself what God has done in the past. He says, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people of Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? So he's saying, God, we not only remember who you are and all your power, but we remember what you have done in the past to help us. All the way you've helped us in the past. We remember the times you've done miracles. You've blessed our lives. You've answered prayers. You've given us guidance. You've provided for all our needs. We remember all those times you've shown yourself faithful. You've shown yourself trustworthy in our lives. We've seen your power in our lives. We've seen the good things you've done. We've seen all the ways you've blessed us. And we haven't forgotten it, God. We remember what you've done. I want to recommend that if you don't do this already, that you start some kind of journal where you write down your prayers and you write down the answers that you see to them. You know, I've got some journals going back 30 years or more that that have stuff in them. I would never, ever remember all the things God did for me 30 years ago unless I'd written them down. And now I can, I can read those and I go back and I say, wow, you know, I remember that now, you know, God was so good. And it builds my faith for today because of what God has done for me in the past. Jehoshaphat remembers what God has already done and then he specifically reminds God of three kinds of situations where God has helped him. In verse nine it says, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, We will stand in your presence and we'll cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. And so he lists three kinds of problems. First, the sort of judgment. Those are the tragedies that tear us up. Second, plagues. Those are illnesses or physical problems. And third, famines. Those are the material or financial problems. And so Jehoshaphat says, God, whatever kind of problem may come along, whether it's tragedies or illnesses or financial problems, God, we're going to look to you. We're going to expect a miracle because we've seen you do it before. You've come through and you've rescued us time after time after time after time. And so Jehoshaphat says, God, we know who you are and we remember what you've done. The third thing Jehoshaphat says is, 
will you not? And this is where you ask God, do it again. Verse 12, he says, our God, will you not judge them? He says, God, you know all about this enemy army that's coming against us, and and you know that we didn't do anything to cause it. And so, God, will you not judge them? God, we know who you are. We know that you've helped us in the past. So, God, do it again. Help us out. We need another miracle. We need an instant replay. You've done this before. You've rescued us before. Would you do it again? So, Jehoshaphat asks these three questions. Are you not, did you not, will you not? Then he makes his statement in the second part of verse 12. He says, for we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. And here's the statement. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That is a statement of dependence on God. And by the way, when you need a miracle, humility is a good thing. Okay? You know, even if you're praying in great faith, it's all right to admit that you're desperate. It's all right to admit you have no power and that you don't know what to do. That's exactly what the people of Israel said here. We have no power and we don't know what to do. You know, I wonder if there's some of you sitting here this morning who would say, you know what, that describes me. You know, I'm facing this, this thing in my life. I need a miracle in my finances or my job or my kids or my, my marriage or, or my health, whatever. And I, I need a miracle, and I have no clue what to do. If that's where you are today, that means you're in the perfect place for God to send along a miracle. You admit your need to help, and then what's next? Focus on God, not the problem. He continues in verse 12. We have no power to face this vast army that's attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We don't have a clue, but our eyes are on you. We fix our eyes not on the problem, not on the circumstance, not on the situation, not on the impossibility, but on God. So let me ask you, in the problem that you're facing right now, and the challenge you have in your life right now. Are your eyes on that problem or on God? So many people focus on the circumstances. You ever ask anybody, how you doing? And, and they say, well, I'm doing okay under the circumstances. I think God would say, what are you doing under the circumstances? You know, circumstances are like a mattress. If you get underneath them, you suffocate. If you get on top of them, you rest easy. And the point is that you don't focus on your circumstances or you'll suffocate. You focus on God, not the problem. If your focus is on God, you can overcome anything. Look at verse 15. It says, after they had prayed, God responded to that prayer of faith. And and here's what God said. Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You've probably heard people say that before. The battle is not mine, it's God's. This story is where that statement comes from. Let me tell you, that is God's word for you this morning. The battle is not yours but God's. If you are seeking to put God first in your life, if you're trying to follow him, then the battle is not yours but God's. And that is good news. You know why some of us get so tired? It's because we're spending all our time trying to fight God's battles. And we get discouraged because we're trying to solve this situation ourselves, but but it's really God's battle. And we want to help God out. We want to help him solve the problem. And and then we fail and we fall and, and we say, oh God, I'm so sorry I let you down. And he says, you didn't let me down because you weren't holding me up. This is not your battle. It's my battle. In verse 17, God says, You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. By the way, it's interesting that this verse, verse 17, is the exact middle verse of the whole Old Testament. And the interesting part is not that it happens to be the middle verse of the whole Old Testament, but the fact that the middle verse is such a powerful and significant verse, a verse that you could apply in your life, I can apply in my life today to to our problems that we've got, anything that's got us worried and frustrated. He says, stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. 
God says, the battle is not yours, it's mine. You don't have to fight it. If it's God's will, then it's God's problem. And he'll fight the battle. God tells us, if you're my child, then your problems are my problems. Your battle is my battle. So take up your position of faith, fix your eyes on me, and trust me to work it out. He says, take up your positions and stand firm. What does it mean to stand firm? Stand firm is an attitude of quiet confidence. You stand firm. And when you're standing firm, do you know what it's impossible to do? It's impossible to run away when you're standing firm. Maybe you have a situation in your life where you kind of feel like running away from things. You want to walk out on the situation or or quit or give up because it's just too hard. But it is never God's will for you to run from a situation. In fact, I've discovered when I do run, God just brings the same thing around in my life again and again until I quit running from it. Why? Because God wants me to learn and grow. Now, he wants me to trust him to fight the battle. So I need to stand firm. Now, when I stand firm, what do I stand on? When I'm waiting for a miracle in my finances or marriage or business or whatever, what do I stand firm on? He tells us in verse 20, there's two things. He says, listen to me, Judah. This is God speaking. Listen to me, Judah, and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. So he tells us to have faith in two things. There's two things he lists that we're supposed to stand firm on. First is the character of God. God is faithful. God is good. And he doesn't take you out on a limb and then cut the limb off. So God wants us to learn to trust him in everything. So we stand firm on faith in him, on his nature and his character. And second, we can stand firm on the truth of God's word. Notice it says, have faith in his prophets. The Bible is the word of God that is primarily spoken through God's prophets. And so we can stand firm on and have faith in God's word. So let's summarize so far. When you need a miracle, schedule time for prayer. Focus on God, not the problem. And then the final thing we see in this story is worship and thank God in advance. Verse 21, after consulting with the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. Now, get this picture. The enemies on one hillside, the Israelites on the other hillside getting ready to march down into the valley to meet in battle and right before they go jehoshaphat says okay here's the battle plan the choir is going to be in front now if i was in that choir i think that i would be uh considering and you know what i just remembered i left the stove on i gotta go turn it off Uh, see you guys later or or, you know what I think I'm kind of coming down with a cold. I, I don't think I can really sing today. Uh, I'll see you guys later. You know, I wouldn't want to be in that choir on the front line going up against this enemy army with swords and spears and I got a tambourine. Okay? I'm sorry. But this is a real statement of faith here. It's a very real of saying, a real way of saying, God, instead of worrying, we are worshiping. And we're going to thank you, God, in advance for what you're going to do, even though we don't see it yet. That's what practical faith looks like. Worshiping and thanking God in advance for what he's promised to do. And what happened next in verse 22? As they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah And they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Mount Seir, they helped to destroy one another. Something miraculous happened. God set ambushes. Now, we don't even know what that is. We don't know what God actually did. We just know that whatever it was, it caused huge confusion among these enemy armies. And those three opposing armies began to fight and kill each other while the Israelites stood there worshiping and thanking God. And notice it says, as they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes. God didn't start fighting until they started singing, until they started worshiping and thanking 
God was waiting for them to demonstrate their faith, and then he ambushed the enemy. And again, we don't know what God did to ambush them. All we know is that God said, the battle is mine. You won't have to fight it. And that is exactly what happened. He caused the enemy to destroy each other to the point that not even one soldier escaped. There is power in praising and thanking God in advance. Some of you are facing a difficult situation in your personal life right now, and you need a miracle. When are you going to start thanking God and praising Him for the answer? Are you going to wait until it happens? If you thank Him after it happens, then that is not faith. That's gratitude, not faith. And, and gratitude is good. We should have, we should be, uh, you know, uh, grateful for what God does, but it's not faith. Faith is thanking God in advance and worshiping before the answer comes. Well, let's look at the results of this kind of faith because when you let God fight the battles, when you let God work the miracles and you let Him solve the impossible situation in your life, there are some exciting results. In verse 25 it says, So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. They had more loot than they could even carry away. Now, had they prayed for this? No. Did they ask God to bless them financially? No. They were just hoping they wouldn't get killed by these enemies' armies coming against them. They, you know, they, the, again, wealth was the last thing on their mind at that point. But we see a principle here. When we approach God in faith, when we depend on Him and trust in Him and put our eyes on Him, He not only meets our needs, but He often blesses us with way more besides blessings that we never even asked for, blessings that we didn't even imagine. And in fact, God gives more, often gives more blessing than you can handle. He outdoes himself. He exceeds your expectations. He blessed these people more than they could have imagined. It, it, it took them three days just to carry away all the blessing. And then it says, on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Bar- Barakah, where they praised the Lord. This is why it's called the valley of Barakah to this day. Barakah in Hebrew means blessing. And this is such a great picture because... God wants every believer to live in the valley of blessing. He wants you and I to live in the valley of blessing. Now, what does that mean, to live in the valley of blessing? Does that mean that we don't ever have any more problems in our lives? No, that's not what it means. Does it mean that we all get rich? No. Living in the valley of blessing doesn't mean that I never have any more marriage problems. It doesn't mean that I never have any more health problems or, or that I always get the promotion of work. No, what it does mean is that as I depend on God in faith, as I trust Him to meet my needs, and I fix my eyes on Him, He is not only faithful to meet my needs, but he blesses me in a lot of other ways that I never even expected, in ways that I didn't even ask for, that I didn't even anticipate. And I find myself living in the valley of blessing. In fact, we see in the story that the people of Israel got another blessing that they never expected and that they hadn't anticipated or even asked for. In verse 29, it says, The fear of God came upon all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. You see, when God does a miracle as a result of our faith, it demonstrates God's reality even to unbelievers. Everybody else heard about this miracle. All the surrounding kingdoms heard about it, and they took notice. And they were afraid to even mess with Israel after that. And so the people of Israel had peace on every side. Had they prayed for that? No. But he gave it to them anyway. You see, the world takes notice when Christians live by faith. And God loves to demonstrate his power to people who believe and who fix their eyes on God in faith. I'd like the worship band to come up and do a closing song for us now. As they do, let's stand together in prayer. 
Will you bow together with me? This morning, I don't know what kind of difficult situation that you're facing. Maybe you've got some challenges in your marriage. Maybe the pressure at work is getting to you. Maybe your kids have made some bad choices or you've gotten bad news from the doctor. Whatever it is, God has a specific word for you today. He says to you this morning, the battle is not yours, it's mine. You can relax, trust me, stand still in quiet confidence. Trust me and let me fight for you. So God, we thank you for who you are. Are you not the God who holds all power and all might in your hand? You rule over every kingdom and every power in this world, and nothing can withstand you. God, we also thank you for what you've done in the past, for what you've done in our lives, for all the answered prayers, for all the provision, for all the protection, for all the blessings that you've brought into our lives. We thank you that you have shown yourself faithful in our lives. And now, Lord, we ask you, will you not do it again? We ask you to bring your power and your might to work in our difficult situations, in our marriages, in our finances, in our health situations, in our job situations. Would you show your faithfulness and goodness to us once again by meeting our needs? We're asking you to do this, God, because we admit that we do not have the power to face everything that's coming against us. And we don't always know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you.